The idea of a portrait as a highly realistic rendering of an individual is probably less rare than the use of portraiture to express something as a symbol. Behind me are two of Rome's emperors, the first, Augustus, and the fifth, Nero. Roman visual culture was dominated by Greek art, and particularly they inherited the mantle of the art that had been produced by Alexander the Great. And the portrait bust of Augustus is a rather subtle combination of the idealized versions coming from Alexander the Great and the actual features of Augustus himself, the small mouth, the rather strangely shaped flat sort of head uh, that he has. One difference in this, though, is that the eyes are larger. Other busts and portraits of Augustus have him having small, rather close together eyes. So you see this mixture here. This kind of sculpture would have been put in cities across the uh, Roman Empire uh, to express the power and the ubiquity of, uh, of Augustus's rule. The portrait of the young Nero um, shows even more realism, though, than the Augustus piece. The Romans were at heart, I think, engineers, and there was a kind of a no-nonsense feeling to their art. And so when they did portraits, they much more emphasized the individual than was common in the Greek tradition. And you can see the young Nero here uh, with his rather large nose and his extraordinary jug ears and the rather relatively straight uh, hair. Claudius, who, when he announced that Nero was going to be the emperor, it turned out to be a pretty bad decision, uh, would have had these sculptures placed around the Roman Empire to let people know that this was the coming um, emperor. So both of these portraits symbolize power as much as convey a, an individual personality. But there's still another way that you can mix portraiture with symbolism if you just come this way. With these four sculptures, we move to the very eastern end of the Roman Empire. In fact, with these two, probably a little bit beyond it. Alexander the Great is credited with conquering Afghanistan, although he really won a couple of battles and kept moving through. Uh, but in this sculpture here, you see the Greek, the Hellenistic tradition, blending with other traditions, Buddhist sculpture, Indian uh, sculpture. The man on the right there is fairly recognizable. He looks pretty much like an individual with his particularly shaped nose and his furrowed brows. But the, this portrait on the right is of a bodhisattva, an individual who's nearly uh, reached uh, perfection. Um, and uh, that is reflected in the slight smile and in, in the eyes, the, the hooded eyes here that shows a kind of otherworldly um, uh, existence. In fact, it's probably stretching it to call that a portrait at all. Whereas those two sculptures there, you see the two gentlemen from Palmyra, an extraordinary trading part in an area of the world that we now call, is now known as Syria. And here we have these individuals carved. It's not superb carving, but we can see that they were, in fact, uh, different people. And the more dominating feature here is, of course, the eyes. These were funerary sculptures. They were put in a particular niche, um, in a place where people could go and remember these particular individuals. But with the eyes, we see that they're looking into eternity. As it was said, the eyes are the window of the soul, and they certainly have plenty of soul. <laughs>